Given the magical subject matter, this would have made a great video for last month. Welp. If there's one thing I hope you take away from this video, it's this. Homestuck's world building is bananas. Well, make that two things. Don't attempt alchemy, you'll probably poison yourself. Andrew Hussey didn't need to go this hard into the minute details of this massive webcomic, but he did. It's been years since the original webcomic's wrap-up, and I feel like I'm just getting past the surface level stuff. Hussey really gets technical when he adds elements of alchemy into his story. Of course, the characters use Spurbs alchemical machines to create weapons and items, but it's not really alchemy. Well, it is by definition, but it isn't. Let me try to explain. Long story short, alchemy was a form of proto-science and magic whose aim was to turn base metals into noble ones, discover a cure for disease, and find a way of extending life. Alchemical studies are found all over the Old World, but it's mostly prevalent and well-documented through European texts. Amazingly, despite the differencing languages, all forms have the root word chem in its name, but no one is entirely sure why? Makes sense that the aspects and studies of alchemy were the stepping stones of modern medicine and chemistry. For example, while invented centuries earlier, the double boiler or bon marie was brought to the scientific community by alchemists. Though, sorry to upset the full metal alchemist fan base out there, but the law of equivalent exchange is not actually in the study of alchemy. That said, it is part of the first law of thermodynamics and the law of conservation of mass. Like the Law of Equivalent Exchange, there are other stories of alchemy that are just as well known. Wizened alchemists combining various amounts of mercury and sulfur in their attempts to transmute copper into silver and lead into gold. Tales of monstrous chimeras, creatures hypothetically made by alchemically combining two or more animals. And then there was the alchemist's dream, eternal life via the philosopher's stone, the highly strived for great work that gave you the power of God. After all, if you found out how God used the elements to make life, you'd have the power of God yourself. Needless to say, alchemy was also the starting point for charlatanism. Ye old snake oil salesman. I'm going to say this again for YouTube's benefit, if not for yours. Alchemy is pseudoscience. It does not work. The chemical formulas were debunked by the 19th century. Please don't use mercury and try to turn lead into gold. By comparison, Homestuck's alchemy system is a little different. Instead of beakers and sulfur, the kids are using elements called grist with a punch card and a 3D printer-like system to synergize items. We are way past the idea of changing one metal into another. Alchemists couldn't even dream up this kind of transmutation. But here's the thing. Grist. The alchemy you do in Spurb is entirely dependent on the grist you've managed to gather. Grist acts more like a currency, item drops that you have to beat out of baddies to obtain. And you can't transmute one kind of grist into another. Some grist can only be found by befriending that lonely cherub who wandered into your game. So if you can't gather enough diamonds, I'm sorry, you can't make that sweet Snoop Dogg snow cone machete, my dude. Then there's Spurb's ultimate alchemy. Using a lit forge and a fully prototyped battlefield, the ultimate alchemy is what brings about a new universe post-game. And it requires, you guessed it, a whole lot of grist. So much grist that you're either grinding monsters for a real long time, breaking the laws of time and space, or you have to kill the denizens of the player planets. You see what I mean about confusing comparisons? Comparing classical alchemy with Homestuck's version is a very strange Venn diagram. It's... it's beyond my comprehension, is what I'm saying. Of course, this doesn't mean that Homestuck as a whole doesn't have other elements linked with alchemy. After all, both are incredibly dense 
subjects. For example, alchemists believed that substances, mind, philosophies, religion, magic, and astrology were all related to each other. In fact, astrology, alchemy, and magic fall under Hermeticism, studies of subjects associated with the Greek god Hermes, or Mercury. I meant Mercury. Ah, why do I do this to myself? Alchemists also believed that the world was made up of four classical elements, water, fire, earth, and air, and that their forms in sulfur, mercury, and salt acted as the building blocks needed to turn base metals into gold and silver. Now, many a homestuck theorist has pointed out that each beta kid is associated with one of the four classic elements. John is the heir of breath, with literal power over his element, who was given the planet of Loas, the land of wind and shade. Rose lived on top of a waterfall, enters Spurb during a downpour, and her planet is the submerged Lolar, the land of light and rain. Dave lived in humid Houston, Texas, which proceeded to burn around him as he entered the game, and his planet is the lava-filled Lohak, the land of heat and clockwork. Jade is a little bit harder to pin on this concept, but considering her living on a very verdant island, a hunk of land in the middle of water, that she's associated early on with uranium, and that she shares her name, Jade, with the name of a mineral, she fits with the elements as well. The Beta Kids ultimately have to reset their world in order to play the game again, giving rise to Earth B and the Alpha Kids, where their progenitors enter the game as players. The Alpha Kids are referred to as nobles in their dead session. In fact, their planets are named after four noble gases, Neon, Krypton, Helium, and Xenon. So the four classical elements combined forces to change something more base into something noble. Alchemy in action! Now there are several creatures that have importance in the study of alchemy, like the phoenix and the white swan, but one big contender is the green lion, often depicted eating the sun. The green lion represented iron sulfate, or vitriol, a green chemical that was used in attempt to purify metals to pure gold. The lion devouring the sun also served as a metaphor, if you were said to have the spirit of the green lion, you tended to act destructively. So, saying someone is vitriolic is to say that they are mean, spiteful, or cruel. There's also one particular green lion that is said to be the root of the essence, or soul, of the metals. In the Cosmopolite, a 16th century book on alchemy, one kind of green lion is said to be the key to understanding the seven core metals of alchemy and their connection to their ruling planets, opening portals to them and their powers in order to help transmute items. Now, if you manage to use those powers to gain the power of God, well, you'd probably be able to merge the worlds together. Figuratively, of course. Hmm... Then there's this strange pair of lions that keeps popping up. There's the Ouroboros, the two contraries. But I think those fit better with another complicated spurb mechanic that I'll need to cover in another video next year. And that's all I have to say on this subject right now. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I even have a Patreon. Though I really need to post more on there more often. Those poor people. For those who are new to the channel, hi, hello, welcome. I like to take December off to hang around my family and re-energize my introverted self for the next year. But if something related to Homestuck happens to, I don't know, update during the break, I tend to jump on at PDQ. Anyway. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you all next time. Bye! Hey there. Consider becoming a patron, just like the phenomenal Bleed Red, Alexander Madeline, and Cloudy Days.